this um, membership form, if you're not a member of the Historical Society, they're on the back um, mantle. We'd love to have you join. Um, your memberships help us to put these programs on for free, so we really appreciate your membership. Um, tonight's program is on the Spanish-American War and um, Camp Wyckoff in Montauk and how it impacted East Hampton, which is what we're talking about this, uh, this winter, East Hampton, the home front. And we're very excited uh, that Richard Barons is going to speak to us tonight. Uh, we consider Richard Barons a great treasure in the Historical Society. He is our executive director, and we think he's really terrific. So we think you're really going to enjoy this program. Well, I'm not sure how exciting the program is, but I think it is. I really began to get quite fascinated. This all started when my wife was doing some work for Bob Hefner and going through the star, particularly in the 1880s and 90s, uh, doing some research on the Moran family. And she mentioned to me these very interesting little tidbits about the Spanish-American War, particularly about Camp Wyckoff. And so I thought it would be decided, Barbara and I, that it would be neat to put the Spanish-American War in the context of our program. But I think I really do have to do a little introduction on the Spanish-American War. Um, so we'll do that. A little bit about the history of Camp Wyckoff, and then I will end with using the star and the small articles in the star that I think will point out how positively astonishing, how positively heroic um, East Hampton was in helping the survival rate at Camp Wyckoff. I think we don't necessarily realize the role that our village played. Anyway, almost forgotten today, the Spanish-American War survives like so much of the past, encapsulated by an obtuse uh, motto, which is remember the main. Let me build up a little background so we can better understand why Montauk's Camp Wyckoff existed at all. I'll start by focusing on the last decade of the 19th century. And much of this story I think you're going to find rather familiar, reoccurring in fact in American history. By the late 1800s, we had expanded our national borders to the Pacific and settled southern disputes with Mexico. Our pushes for new territory created heavy losses of Native American lives at a time when the military and our national coffers were still shrouded by the debt of the Civil War. We looked beyond the continental United States for developing markets. With plans for a canal through Central America being touted, our national enthusiasms turned toward, towards the Caribbean. Cuba seemed an excellent investment. Close by, with a cheap and abundant labor force, rich in farmland and natural resources, Cuba was ruled by Spain. American citizens soon owned about $50 million of this island's real estate. The profits were worth millions of dollars also to the investors who owned mostly sugar and tobacco plantations and ironworks. The native Cubans suffered under colonial Spanish rule. The island's history was rife with insurrections and revolution. The freedom movement of 1895 was serious enough to hinder the success of the American interests. American investors were worried for their profits and their property rights and just getting goods out of the country to the distributors was being interrupted. President William McKinley was under a strong public pressure to defend American interests. And the United States press, under the leaderships of William Randolph Hearst and his nemesis, Joseph Pulitzer, needed a cause to their goal of a million readers per corporation. Cuba was a crisis in the making. The two competing, competing newspapers created a multi-ring circus of yellow journalism. Indeed, it is during this period that the word yellow journalism gets invented, a base very much on the famous first color cartoon, The Yellow Kid. Um, whipping up the uh, John Q. public's courage and outrage against Spain's mistreatment of their Cuban subjects, there was certainly atrocious activities to report but the ferocity of the reporting really wasn't balanced 
When the Spanish began to move entire Cuban village populations into concentration camps, diplomacy was no longer on the table. We needed an event to justify U.S. intervention, and we were given two, both in 1898. A newspaper got hold of a personal letter written by a Spanish minister of the United States to a friend in Havana. In that letter, President McKinley is called a weakling, dot, 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 bitter for admiration of the crowd, dot, dot, dot. But the real cause celeb had to be the sinking of the battleship USS Maine while moored in Havana's harbor. The Maine had been sent to Cuba on a goodwill visit. It had been in the harbor for three weeks and was the site of dinners with the new Cuban governor. Optimism seemed to be in the air. The battleship was the largest boat to have entered Havana's harbor. It was February 15th, 9.10 in the evening. On board, taps had just been heard. The captain was writing a letter home when the explosion came. It was a bursting, metallic screeching and crashing roar of immense volume. There was a tremor like an earthquake. The ship lurched. The lights blinked and went black. Thick, choking, hazardous smoke blinded the sailors and gagged their throats. The main had been blown up and was listing to port. The ship was sinking. 254 seamen were killed and another 59 were wounded. Eight of those soon would be dead. The Navy conducted an investigation. The Spanish conducted an investigation. The cause of the disaster or who was responsible was never fully proved. But American newspapers had no doubt about the responsible party. Cowardly Spanish headlined American papers. Hearst New York Journal even published an artist rendering showing the Spanish saboteurs fastening the underwater explosive while others waited on the shore to detonate the mine. For weeks after disaster, the New York Journal devoted more than eight pages a day to the story. And we think the O.J. Simpson thing was big, right? <laughs> Hundreds of editorials demanded that Americans' honor be avenged. The rallying cry was, remember the main to hell with Spain. Though apocryphal, Hearst reportedly got a telegram from Frederick Remington, his illustrator in Cuba. There is no war, stop. Request to be returned, stop. Hearst's reply, please remain, stop. You furnish the pictures, stop. I'll furnish the war stop. <laughs> war was in the air. The Maine was lost on February 15th, and on February 17th, the Naval Board of Inquiry started its investigation. The next morning, the Spanish cruiser Vizcaya arrived in New York in a reciprocal goodwill visit for the USS Maine. The Spanish ship was unaware that the Maine had been lost. It sailed for Havana eight days later. That same day, Theodore Roosevelt, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, cabled Commodore Dewey, advising him to be ready if war was to be called. On March 8th, Congress authorized $50 million for a war fund. Remember, 1898, $50 million. By March 21st, the Board of Inquiry found that the Maine was lost to a mine. Five days later, McKinley received the report the next morning demanded that Spain end its war with Cuba. On March 28th, Congress heard the Maine Inquiry Report. On the same day, the Spanish Inquiry was received. Their finding was that the sh battleship's loss was due to an internal accident. Barrels of oil stored near the boiler. Two days later, our U.S. Minister to Spain requested that Cuba be given her independence. By the next day, Spain turned down the minister's request. April 1st, the House of Representatives authorized $22.6 million for naval vessels. April 6th, the Pope urged McKinley not to declare war pending his negotiations with Spain. The next day, the ambassadors of England, France, Italy, Germany, Austria, and Russia appealed to the president for peace. April 9th, Spain declared armistice in Cuba, and American citizens began to exit. April 11th, McKinley asked the Congress for war on Spain.
Within six days, the army began to mobilize. The Congress declared Cuba independent on April 9th, and three days later, the Americans uh, commenced a blockade around Cuba and took their first prisoner of a Spanish ship. April 25th, McKinley called for 125,000 volunteers as Spain declared war on the United States. That same day brought our declaration of war against Spain, making it retroactive to April 22nd because of that Spanish ship that we had captured. We were in war. The official war had started April 22nd, 1898, and it was over when Spain approved peace on September 10th, 1898. On December 12th, the Treaty of Paris ended the conflict. The war had lasted about four months. It cost $250 million. Our treaty established the independence of Cuba. It ceded Puerto Rico and Guam to the United States. It allowed us to purchase the Philippine Islands for $20 million, which we did. We also had gotten our oldest overseas outpost, Guantanamo Bay. Used by our army since the Spanish-American War, we officially leased this 45-square-mile base in 1903. Inspired by our might, what we did is we became an international power. We annexed the Hawaiian Islands because our government declared them necessary as a naval base. We had been anxious to do this for about 20 years, so this was a perfect excuse. The Caribbean was secured, allowing for the construction of the Panama Canal. Heretofore, there was much negativity. When you're in charge, there's not that much negativity. We had become this great power in Asia. Shipping routes and military facilities were established. The cost beyond dollars for this war 3,000 of our officers and enlisted men died, 90% of them from disease. Our government realized that our soldiers, weakened by poor diet, unclean and alien environments and overwork, were in the midst of a major outbreak of disease. The returning men could not immediately be sent back to their homes, since the contagious diseases they could be carrying included yellow fever, malaria, and typhoid. We needed to find an isolated camp where the men could first be cleaned of disease before mustered out. How about 5,000 acres of land owned by the Long Island Railroad Company in a place called Montauk Point? Brilliant idea. Part of the dream of Austin Corbin, this land had been procured by the LIRR for an adventurous project, the port of entry for European arrivals. Already, Fort Pond Bay, with its deep and safe harbor, had an impressive pier and eight side tracks connecting to New York City. But it had sat seldom used since its completion two years before. The government rented the land for $15,000 with an agreement to run between August 2nd, 1898 and May 31st, 1899. The Long Island Railroad allowed the government full use of all rail lines, terminals, docks, and agreed to install additional sidings and terminals at its own expense. The camp was named for Colonel Charles Wyckoff of the 22nd U.S. Infantry, Infantry, who was killed at San Juan Heights assault. Wells were dug four and a half miles. By the way, what you're seeing is, I think, an astonishing collection of about 65 images uh, from three of our major holdings in the area, from the Montauk Library, from our collection, and from the collection of photographs at the Southampton Historical Museum. So sort of a montage to go with what we're talking about. There were t the wells were dug, four and a half miles of new rails were laid. A hundred local carpenters began to construct buildings, including five warehouses. One was to be 30 by 600 feet, and other sheds and tent platforms. There will be, be at least 5,000 beds and 1,000 tents. The plan had the tired and weakened Santiago Heroes camp along the ocean because they could not be bothered there by mosquitoes. And the wounded and sick in their section could benefit from the ocean breezes. These two areas would each have their own hospitals. This tent city had to be big enough to accommodate 20,000 men. Time was a crucial factor, and time was not to favor Camp Wyckoff. 
work got off slowly. There were strikes and difficulty in obtaining the needed supplies. Only six days after the lease was signed, six days after the lease was signed, the troops stationed in Florida began to arrive. 3,500 cavalrymen and 5,000 horses filled the unprepared camp with total chaos. Horses trained to be orderly in March became even dangerous when they weren't tethered. They blocked roads, they stopped supply deliveries. Seven days passed. The camp wasn't ready. No floors for the tents. Understaffed hospitals, short on rations. The troops from abroad began to arrive. Daily transports filled the camp until there were 22,221 soldiers in Montauk. The camp hospitals treated 10,000 men in 30 days. The staff included over 300 female nurses. In spite of the best intentions and tremendous efforts to support this small city, success was elusive. Help was coming from the surrounding communities. Word got out about mismanagement, dire conditions. The camp was too close to New York. Those reporters who had helped fan the flames of support for the war now were writing about Camp Wyckoff's conditions using the same adjectives. By mid-September, the crisis had subsided. On September 23rd, only seven regiments remained at Montauk. The camp was vacated on October 28th, 1898. The final figures are impressive. Of those 222,221 soldiers who had been residents of Camp Wyckoff, only 257 of them died. The camp had been open for just two months. For local fishermen, the vacant sheds became construction materials for the fishing village. To me, the real story comes off the pages of our paper of record, The Star. Under the editorship of E.S. Bowden, this little vehicle that charged itself with being in quotes on the top underneath the masthead, devoted to the best interests, interests of its town. I'd like to see that back on the paper. Um, commented, sometimes with irony, other times with indignation, and reported on East Hampton's heroic relief effort during this incredible short epic tale. I'll close with a chronological sampling of just a few of the rest of the story right from the pages of our hometown paper. Friday, June 3rd, 1898. The new military camp will in all probability be established within a few days at Montauk. A special train carried President Baldwin of the Long Island Railroad and General Frank, commander of the Department of the East, accompanied by Colonel Gillis, Quartermaster General, and Lieutenant Lyon. The officers made a thorough inspection of the land examined a few weeks ago by Lieutenant Hale of General Merritt's staff. The party took dinner at the third house. Friday, July 29th, 1898, all in favor of sending the Santiago Soldiers here for rest. Long Island Railroad president said the camp will probably be located about a mile from the Long Island Railroad Depot on the ocean side on what we call the Great Plains. Practically every foot of the Montauk property, about three and a half miles by three and a half miles wide, will be made available. Mr. Baldwin said that as soon as the soldiers arrived, the railroad would do everything in its power to add to the facilities and the comfort of the camp. Friday, August 5th, 1898. Arrangements are being made to begin the movement of troops from Santiago to Montauk Point immediately. No sick will be brought north at present, but only the healthy cavalry troops which have been situated on high ground and thus not been infected with disease. Friday, August 5th, 1898. The work will be well underway in a few days when a force of 199 carpenters will make the lumber fly. <laughs> Friday, August 12, 1898, a permanent cavalry camp has been pitched in Montauk. 700 troopers of the 6th Cavalry are encamped at the southern end of Great Pond and are busily preparing for full division, which will be stationed here within a few days. Friday, August 12, 1898, on July 31st, the local Board of Health communicated with the State Board of Health relative to the soldiers from Santiago landing at Montauk. The reply included these lines, and I quote, You are informed that the selection of Montauk Point was made by the Surgeon General of the United States Army, General Sternberg, and it is suggested that the local Board of Health have no authority to interfere with the action of the U.S. authorities in making such a selection, end of quotes. 
Friday, August 12, 1898. The new U.S. disinfecting barge Protector, built in Philadelphia, is en route for Fort Pond Bay, where the vessel will be used as a floating quarantine station. The Protector has a wooden hull 150 feet in length, 27-foot beam, and 10-foot-6 a depth of hold. That's a local newspaper for a fishing community that gives you the size of the boat, right? You know, that wasn't in the New York Times. Friday, August 12, 1898, on Wednesday afternoon, a laborer at the camp named Bernard McKenna of New York sought shelter from the rain under a freight car, standing on the side track. He sat down on the rail and became drowsy. An engine hitched onto the train and started to pull it out when the man not hearing the car's start was crushed under the wheel. The remains were buried in the Amagansett Cemetery yesterday. Friday, August 12, 1898. The people of East Hampton, with generous patriotism, have given most of their time the past two days to feeding the soldiers as they pass through town on their way to the camp. On Wednesday afternoon, the colored troops were held up at the station, where the ladies fairly deluged them with sandwiches, coffee, oranges, peaches, tobacco, cigars, and other delicacies. The men showed hearty appreciation of the treat and cheered lustily as the train pulled out. Wednesday evening, through all of the rain, crowds went to the station, awaited the next train until 11 p.m. Again, the food was passed in windows by the basketful. Friday, August 19th, 1898. The transport Grand Duchess arrived at 4.30 Monday afternoon, having on board 224 sick, two yellow fever cases, and 25 suspects, and also another 1,143 well men. Major John A. Logan, Jr. was on the ship, and his wife and mother were on shore waiting for him. Friday, August 19th, 1898. Colonel Roosevelt has been tendered by the owner of the use of the Alexander E. Orr's cottage, that would be in the Montauk Association, and will occupy it with his officers. The cottage is near General Young's headquarters. Friday, August 19th. This is the order of arrival of the trans transports. The Gate City arriving Saturday evening, 556 men. Uh, the Vigilantia, uh, 6 a.m. Sunday, 699 men. The St. Louis, 7 a.m. Sunday, 872 men. The Miami, 8 p.m. Sunday, about 680 men. The Matawan, Monday, about 600 men. And the St. Paul, 8.45 Monday evening, 1,300 on board. Friday, August 26. There must be a screw loose somewhere when Uncle Sam's soldiers backed by a country of unlimited resources, are allowed to starve on the transports and compelled to depend upon charity for food when they land upon our shores. An editorial from the editor. Friday, August 26, a letter from Mrs. Chadwick. I am thanking the people of East Hampton for their generous help without which I could have done nothing for these poor fellows. I would say it is my purpose to go every Tuesday Thursday and Saturday while the need exists. Also that those who are willing to go and see for themselves and help either go with me or come with me or come to me for information. Friday, August 26th. A canteen will be opened shortly at the camp. Temperance people all over the country have written protests against such a procedure, but to no avail. These stories are where we hear about soldiers can purchase extra luxuries and it has now become a means of debauching the army by the sale of intoxicating liquors. It is a crime which calls to the throne of God for rebuke and redress. The officers have, have, have about decided that a canteen shall be opened in the camp. Friday, August 26, it is reported that one of our philanthropic, the editor puts in a question mark, farmers charges 12 cents a quart for milk to be sent to the soldiers at Montauk. Friday, August 26, Frank Cartwright and Frank S. Edwards are doing a good business at Camp Wyckoff, selling goods which they carry in on wagons. Friday, August 26, Isaac Mayer has erected a small building on Phineas Dickerson's land near Camp Wyckoff and will open a small clothing store there today. <laughs> Friday, August 26, an open letter to the people of East Hampton from H Troop, 1st U.S. Cavalry. We, 
the members of H Troop, 1st U.S. Cavalry, commonly known as Roosevelt's Rough Riders, used this means to thank the kind people of East Hampton for their liberality and generosity in the reception accorded our troop while we passed through your village, and begged to assure them that the bombardment of such luxuries awakened in our breasts the warmest feelings of gratitude. Friday, August 26th, all the daily papers received at the Maidstone Club are put in a bundle and sent to Camp Wyckoff in care of Dr. L.G. Holmes of the Red Cross Hospital on the same day they are received. <laughs> Friday, August 26th, the hospital ship Olivetti, with nearly 206 soldiers on board, left Montauk Sunday afternoon for Boston. The six soldiers on board will be transferred to hospitals there. Friday, August 26, in the fog, the transport uh, prairie ran ashore at Napayag Beach, just each of the life-saving station. She ran full head-on, and her bow is deep in the sand. On board are between 300 and 400 soldiers and a number of horses, her sick number over 100. The life-saving station telephoned to the camp for assistance. A tug is now on its way. Efforts will get her to float. Friday, August 26, Secretary of War Elger is at the camp inspecting the existing conditions there. Elger says matters are not as bad as, it, as they might be. That's certainly comforting to the boys, says the editor. <laughs> Friday, August 26, the Yale came in Tuesday with yellow fever signals flying. Her sick have not yet landed. Friday, August 26, war officials can issue as many statements as they wish about the conditions of the soldiers in the camp. But after the men are mustered out, the horror of the thing will be told to the world in its true light. Editorial. Friday, September 2nd. Dr. Sen thinks that within a month, every person suffering from typhoid fever brought to Camp Wyckoff will have recovered or have died, and that by the time the conditions begin to look as if they have improved, there will come a period of the greatest danger. Friday, September 2nd. The coming of President McKinley is anxiously awaited. An effort will be made to get the President to sanction changes which even General Alger was not asked to make. Friday, September 2nd. The steamer Shinnecock, the finest and largest passenger boat of the Montauk Steamboat Company, has been secured by the government for the transportation of troops from Camp Wyckoff to New York. The steamer reported at Montauk for service on Tuesday, taking with her a ton of supplies from the, for the soldiers from the Sag Harbor Relief Committee. Friday, September 2nd, there was another suicide in camp on Wednesday. Private John Wagner of Company 8, 17th Infantry, hanged himself from the crossbeam of his tent. Wagner came from Cuba 10 days ago and has been sick ever since. He was delirious Tuesday night and early in the morning crawled out of his tent, cut off one of the guy ropes and used it to hang himself. Friday, September 2nd. The people of Sag Harbor are doing good work in gathering and shipping supplies to the soldiers at Camp Wyckoff. This morning, the steamer Montauk took on board a cargo including every conceivable thing to eat. Bread, pies, cereals, vegetables, canned goods, fruits, jellies, preserves, etc., which were landed directly into the camp in time for dinner. Friday, September 2nd. Our reporter called at Mrs. Chadwick's East Hampton home on Wednesday evening and found her home had been turned into a regular receiving station. Boxes and bundles were piled up on all sides. Willing hands were unpacking parcels in one room, while in another room, bottles were being filled with medicines. And Miss Chadwick was kept busy receiving those who brought contributions to go to her to the camp the next morning. One caller brought the evening mail. We once had an evening mail. Brought the evening mail, which contained some cash contributions, one of which was a check for $50. Friday, September 2nd, the Children's Fair raised $50 for the relief effort. Friday, September 2nd, Mrs. Lorenzo G. Woodhouse has leased the second house for the reception of supplies from East Hampton. A portion of the house may also be used for the care of some of the sick. Friday, September 2nd, John Gay has put up a building and opened a livery stable near the camp. Friday, September 2nd, 
W.S. Williams has ovens built at his place near the camp and is doing a big business. He furnishes 1,000 loaves of bread a day to the camp on contract. Friday, September 2nd, the Ladies' Sewing Society held its last meeting at the Maidstone Club last Tuesday. 100 suits of pajamas have been made and sent to the soldiers at Montauk. Also, 16 dozen pillowcases, 6 dozen handkerchiefs, and 6 dozen towels. Friday, September 2nd, all the eggs produced on the east end of Long Island are now shipped to Montauk. And instead of eggs being sent from this section to New York markets, New York eggs are now being sent this way. <laughs> Friday, September 2nd, at Amagansett, 750 sandwiches are made every day at the Seaview House and sent to the camp on order of Mrs. Valentine Mott of the Red Cross Society. Friday, September 2nd, the excursion steamer Long Island, which left Greenport Sunday with a load of excursionists from Montauk, was ordered out of the bay by the USS Alfreda of the Mosquito Fleet. <laughs> the Long Island did not obey the order quick enough and the Alfreda fired a blank gun across her bow. Then the Long Island left. <laughs> Friday, September 9th. David Gardner of East Hampton. That's, that's the one thing I don't really know why he told us David Gardner from East Hampton, but anyway. David Gardner of East Hampton is generously furnishing 25 quarts of milk a day for the use of the Soldiers Relief Corps of East Hampton. Friday, September 9th. The Soldiers Relief Corps of East Hampton has opened a hospital at the north end of the village for the care of six soldiers from Montauk. The large barn on David Fithian's land has been remodeled and fitted up for hospital purposes, and accommodations are provided for 30 patients. The ladies had brought nine men from the camp recently and had been caring for them at the home of Nathaniel Dominey. The ladies have also opened a hospital in Clarence Hand's house. Friday, September 16th, W.H. Baldwin Jr., president of Long Island Railroad, said his railroad has made no money as a result of the location of the camps at Montauk. None. Read my lips. Friday, September 16th, a bronze statue representing a bucking bronco was presented to Colonel Roosevelt by his Rough Riders Tuesday. The original was made by Frederick Remington, and there, there's a couple photographs of the presentation in there the famous artist, and the inscription on the pedestal is presented to Theodore Roosevelt from his regiment at Camp Wyckoff, September 15, 1898. Colonel Roosevelt responded with a short speech. A toast was then taken to the health of the colonel, and three cheers were given. Friday, September 16, Faith Hospital at the head of Newtown Lane, where Dr. Monroe is physician in charge, is also doing good work for the sick soldiers. Uh, Mrs. E. Hume of Flushing Hospital is the chief nurse. Several of the men there are very sick. Friday, September 16th. General Wheeler has looked up the record of the weather at Montauk for the past several winters, and the results are very gratifying to him. He found that the thermometer seldom gets below the freezing point before December, and then only on rare intervals. Friday, September 23rd. Harvey Warner, who until the location of camp at Montauk was station agent there and then was demoted to baggage room, was recently obliged to return to his home at good ground on account of illness. On Tuesday of this week, he died of typhoid fever. Friday, September 30th, the soldiers, the work of the Soldiers Relief Corps of East Hampton, and that is the one problem the star had. I think every week they had a slightly different name for this organization. Um, you can see why we need use acronyms now, uh, have been brought to close by the breaking up of Camp Wyckoff. The ladies of the committee desire to thank most cordially the many friends who have aided them by sending supplies as well as liberal gifts of money. It would be impossible to express adequately our appreciation of all the untiring work of our helpers and of the constant kindness which sends supplies daily, thus enabling our relief corps to work methodically among the men of the infantry division where our diet kitchen was placed. The value of the faithfulness and regularity of the work was felt and acknowledged by the officers and surgeons we came in contact with, and our nurses going daily into those tents were able to note the substantial improvements in the health of the men. Friday, October 7th, 
The memorial services at the cemetery of the General Hospital at Camp Wyckoff took place on Thursday, October 6 at 3 p.m. A delegation of ladies from the Soldiers Relief Corps of East Hampton had been invited to be present, and though through the kindness of Mr. Lisberg and several others, a large quantity of flowers were taken down to decorate the 140-odd graves. Friday, October 7th, 1,500 horses were shipped from Montauk Saturday and Sunday over the Long Island Railroad. They were sent to Huntsville, Alabama. Friday, October 7th, Charles Tillinghast, who has worked at carpentry at Camp Wyckoff, is dangerously ill of typhoid fever. It's reported that Phineas Dickerson of Montauk is also sick with the same disease. And the next issue of the paper, and I have just pulled out a few things for you, the next issue of the paper is very interesting because there is an inquiry about Camp Wyckoff. And the editor of the paper says that one of the most astonishing things he felt is the role that women played in, this, in the role of helping the soldiers. And he knew that a number of the women from the Corps had volunteered to report at the hearing in Washington, and he felt that Washington would not invite these women to talk to him, and he felt that we would be hearing much more of women in politics as time went on. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have the great privilege of presenting to you the 26th President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. I hope I need not say how the letter there to see and be with you here in East Hampton. My regiment and not just my regiment, but all the soldiers at Camp Michael appreciated the help extended from this community, especially people like Mrs. Woodhouse, who brought out fresh provisions. Any man or woman who makes substantial contribution to any one part of the community has helped to uplift the entire community. My friends, life is a great adventure, and I want to say to you, accepted in such a spirit. Nothing in this world is worth having or worth doing unless it requires effort. For not once in a thousand times is it possible to achieve anything worth achieving except by labor, effort, serious purpose, and a willingness to run risk. I earnestly believe in the performance of duty by both men and women. For unless the average man and average woman live lives of duty. Not only our democracy, but civilization itself shall perish. This nation of ours will not be a good place for any of us to live in if it's not a reasonably good place for all of us to live in. We shall never be successful over the dangers that confront us, nor reach true greatness, nor the lofty ideals which the founders and preservers of our mighty federal republic have set before us, and less at first. We are Americans both in heart and soul, and proud beyond measure to bear the title American. For you see, Americanism is not a question of birthplace, creed, or color, but rather a question of purpose, spirit, and ideal. We form one people in the face of all other nations. We all have equal rights and equal obligations. We pay allegiance but to one flag, the stars and stripes. You can applaud that, that's good stuff. <laughs> Those are Roosevelt's actual words taken from a number of different speeches. And when I use Roosevelt's words, my, my name is James Foote. When I use Roosevelt's words, I give it to you in Roosevelt's voice. Uh, the chaos, I'm just looking for my water, here it is. The chaos that ensued at Camp Wyckoff was indicative of that entire war. It was such a quickly planned war that it had shortcomings from the very beginning. Where was Theodore Roosevelt? when the Maine blew up. Well, he was Assistant Secretary of the Navy. I'll give you just a little rundown. I'll give you his short resume. First of all, 
He was born October 27, 1858, at 28 East 20th Street. I was a rather sickly little boy, and owing to my asthma, not able to attend school, I'd excel in any form of sport. So right off the bat, he had to build himself up, which he did. His father built the gymnasium, spent countless hours. He, he was taught at home, passed the entry exams for Harvard. What do you suppose his passion was? What did he want to become of his life? Can we just get blurt out some answers? You know, I don't bite if you have the wrong one. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, he was, he was a certified taxidermist by age 11. He wanted to be a naturalist. I can no more explain my love for the natural sciences any more than I can for California canned peaches. <laughs> and that's, that's what he majored in. He's still, he's a geek. If you look up the word geek in a dictionary at that time, you would have seen a picture of Theodore Roosevelt. Very skinny, thick glasses, a high voice, and all this nervous energy, and he would keep correcting the professors. And they would often say to him, See here, Roosevelt, are you running this class or am I? <laughs> he meets a beautiful Boston debutante, Alice Hathaway Lee. And he tells his friend, you'll see, I shall marry her. She won't have me, but I shall have her. <laughs> it's just what his friend did, laughed at him. But the one thing you learn when you study Roosevelt, if he says course on anything, whether it's to get the attention of a girl, fight a war, whatever, he kept complete focus and he stayed with it. You see, he'd visit her parents, her brothers, and eventually she grew accustomed and found out he was sincere. They were, they were married right after Harvard. He buys land here on Long Island in Oyster Bay to build a family home. He also makes a statement at that time, I think I should be part of the ruling class. Now just who in this great nation of ours is the ruling class? We are. Who said that? You get an A. <laughs> What do you see? Political offices are not the property of the politicians alone. On the contrary, they belong to the men and women of the station and shall be filled with regards to the service of the men and women of this station. In order to change anything for the better, you have to be involved, and he realized that. He becomes an assemblyman, still holds the record, New York State's youngest assemblyman. By age 23, he's minority leader in Albany. By the way, the Republican Party was still the minority back then. <laughs> <laughs> Tragedy strikes Roosevelt. February 12th, he receives a telegram that his wife delivered a beautiful baby girl, which they named Baby Alice after the mother. His wife's maiden name was Alice uh, Hathaway Lee. And uh, two days later, he receives another telegram. You better report at home at once. Both mother and Alice are doing well. Shortly after arriving at his mother's home, by the way, what is February 14th? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, shortly after arriving at his mother's home, his mother dies of typhoid fever. Six hours later in the same house in his arms, his beloved Alice died of Bright's disease. That's a kidney ailment. When my heart's dearest died, the light went for my life forever. Now that's a pretty big, tragedy. That's somewhat of a big blow, is it not? How do you handle something like that? Another thing if you study about Roosevelt, well, as he told a friend, a man can have two kinds of problems. One that can be fixed and one that cannot. Now I suggest the sooner you start working on the problem that can be fixed, the better off you shall feel. As for the problem that cannot be fixed, the sooner you move on, the better off you shall feel. He gives the care of his baby daughter to his oldest sister, Anna, who actually oversaw the construction of Sagamore Hill. He finishes an assembly and he goes out west in cattle ranches. He's our only country's genuine cowboy president. <laughs> he, he, actually, he actually raised, raised cattle. Of course, you've got to realize when he goes out there, he's still this nerdy kid from the east that had read about the west, had romantic notions, had these Outfits made, you know, out of buckskin with fringes, wide sombrero, alligator skin kid, alligator hide boots, and a big silver Tiffany hunting knife in his belt. <laughs> and he blurts out in one of the first rounds. Of, I, I said, ah, uh, I said, now, uh, hasten forward, hasten forward at once. The cowboys fell off the saddle laughing. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> 
speed position and make everything a lot easier. He quickly earned their respect because he put in the same hours they did. When he was thrown from his horse, he'd get back up on it. He goes into town one day. He goes into town, a little town called Mingusville. It was actually, still is in Montana. To take care of business, there's a saloon on the ground floor of the hotel. As he approaches the building, he hears gunshots. He enters in the saloon, there was a bully truck out of his mind, had shot the clock off the wall. <laughs> Roosevelt, part of his regiment to overcome his asthma, he had his father sign him up for boxing lessons, so he knew a martial art. And the key to a martial art part is, you don't go looking for a fight. Now did Roosevelt. He sat down next to the pot belly stove, that bully sees him. I say, I say, four eyes, you're buying the house the next round. That's not worth getting into a fight over, is it? Of course not. But he kept it up. I said, you're buying the house the next round. Well, the other key to a martial art, if you're able to take care of yourself, he never let a bully push you around. Roosevelt took as much as he was going to take, gets up, leads with the right, Follows through with a solid left and knock that bully out cold. <laughs> they they drag that guy out back like nothing to the tool shed for the night. And ever since then, I've been mighty proud of Benono's old four eyes. <laughs> <laughs> if it were not for my time and experiences in North Dakota, I never would have become president. I owe more than I can ever express to the West. And of course, when I speak of the West, I mean the many women that I've met in the West. He, he drew quite a name for himself out there, and rightfully so, he earned it. He comes back after two years, he becomes a U.S. Civil Service Commissioner, then New York City Police Commissioner, and from there, Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Now, in 1897, when he became Assistant Secretary of the Navy, the nation of Chile, I repeat, Chile, we'll get a little geography in tonight, after all, we're here at the Academy. <laughs> How many coasts does Chile have to defend? One, One. One. yeah, the West Coast. We have three coasts. And we had a smaller Navy than Chile. Because <laughs> it fell into disrepair after the Civil War. Roosevelt was a big advocate for naval power. He read uh, Alfred Melhan's uh, The History of, uh, History of the World and Sea Power. And it was influential on him. The peace policy of the United States is only as strong as the United States Navy and no stronger. Fortunately for Roosevelt, the Secretary of the Navy, John D. Long, was a, a, a chronic hypochondriac. So he spent as much time out of Washington as possible at his house in Massachusetts and left the Navy Department with his assistant. Where Roosevelt, from that position, started what he could to build up our Navy. And the Maine was sent to Van Harbor, goodwill and also to look, much as like we send an aircraft carrier around now, to look after American interests. It blows up on the 15th of February. Of course, Hearst, and by the way, just to correct a little bit, Hearst sent Remington down to Cuba in 1896 to send back pictures of the Cuban insurrection. That's, and that's when uh, Remington wires them back. There's, there's not much happening here. But you'll supply the pictures, and. I'll supply the war. <laughs> so this, when that, when that ship blows up, they had a field day with it. Uh, Roosevelt appointed a commission. And his uh, son-in-law, a young Navy captain, was there. And they recovered a naval Colt service pistol from that wreck and presented it to Theodore Roosevelt. He used that when he went up San Juan Heights. But 10 days after the main blows up, Roosevelt sends a cable to Dewey. We won a war, Dewey's squadron was in Hong Kong. Dewey, keep the squadron cold, cold in the event of war, steam in the middle of the bay. So when we did go to war, Dewey steamed in the middle of the bay, captured the Spanish squadron in the Philippines with the loss of one American life. And you know how that poor fellow passed away? Heat exhaustion down the boiling room. <laughs> but why? Because he was prepared. Roosevelt thought ahead. He was also a man of honor. He did advocate war with Spain. In fact, he got annoyed with McKinley hesitating. And rightfully so, I could see McKinley a little bit hesitant to send young lives into war 
because he served during the Civil War. You know, the, the vivid memory, fresh in his mind, a body stacked like Gordon. In fact, Roosevelt wrote to his friend, Senator Henry, Henry Cabot Lodge, from the neck up, President McKinley's every bit of president, but he has no more backbone than a chocolate egg cloud. <laughs> 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 he did advocate war, and he believed if you do advocate war, you better be willing to go to the front lines. When we go to war, he pleads to form his own volunteer cavalry regiment, and McKinley was going to give him the command of it. Roosevelt had a huge ego. He knew how to control it. He knew he did not have enough experience as an officer to command, command a regiment. He was a captain in the New York State National Guard, which, which most Knickerbocker gentlemen had some position at that time. But he knew he didn't have the experience. So he told McKinley, appoint Colonel Leonard Wood as commander, and I'll be lieutenant colonel. They trained in San Antonio. And what was the name of that regiment? Anybody remember? Ah, yes, all Northerners and Southerners. Easterners and Westerners. We had cowboys from the West and college boys from the East. No matter what their social position, no matter where they've come, they possessed in common the traits of hardihood and a thirst for adventure. Of course I'm proud of my regiment. There's been none other such as it. The regiment was full, equipped, trained, put on transports, and carried through two glorious victories within 50 days. I think that would be the record hard to beat. He set up recruiting at the Hotel Manger, which is right next to the Alamo. It's still there. It's the oldest hotel west of the Mississippi. 10,000 men. Because of Roosevelt's reputation as a police commissioner, as a cowboy out west, because he's always, he's one of the first to really be a, a media hog, get all the press he could. <laughs> 10,000 people showed up. The Manger, out of that, a thousand were chosen. They trained there. The regular army, which was a state militia, they, they went to that war in surplus Civil War War. Remember, that war was fought in Cuba in the summer. <laughs> Roosevelt outfitted his men in, in cotton trousers and cotton blouses. And the regular troops had trapdoor Springfields. In other words, you had to put the bullet in one at a time. Load it, aim, shoot. You take the bullet out, reload it, aim, shoot. Plus that, they were using black powder. Theory being, black powder makes a lot of smoke when you fire it. Well, the wizards, the ordnance department, they figured this way would mask the soldier and give him like a little smoke screen. In reality, what it does, when you fire that, it's like turning on a neon sign, I'm standing here. <laughs> Plus, they didn't want a rapid-fire weapon. Well, the soldiers will move away shots. They have a rapid-fire weapon. Roosevelt outfitted his men at Craig's and held five bullets in the magazine. So, once again, he, he treated his, his regiment well. They train in San Antonio. Remember, horse soldiers. They train on a horse. They load them all on trains, report to Tampa, and right away, the domino effect of mismanagement starts because supplies were horrible in Tampa. Tampa was a sleepy little town in Florida. It was about as far south as you could go in the, in the country at that time. Any further south, you risk getting malaria, yellow fever. And uh, here everything piles in at once. And the Rough Riders had a reputation of their own. Their chaplain, Chaplain Brown, once said to the Rough Riders, that a Rough Rider will only shoot a man if he cheats at cards. And any man who cheats at cards deserves to be shot. <laughs> so there, they get word the New York 71st is due to board the Yucatan as a transport from Tampa to Cuba. What they do, they hijack a coal train, climb into the empty cars because the train was coming back from the pier, and have the train back all the way down to the piers and they jump on the Yucatan first <laughs> before the 71st got there. Of course, in Roosevelt, like I said, he loved the media. First, really, he knew the value of the media. Well, if you want to reach out to people, how are you going to do it? You've got to use the media. There's an Edison group 
an innocent film crew standing on the pier. He invites them along to Cuba. <laughs> now, due, due to the mismanagement, there was only room on the ships for the men, not the horses. Only senior officers could bring their, their mounts with them. Reason being, the soldiers could see a, a, an officer on mount, and, and the officer could see the soldiers. I might also add, if you're the one up on horseback, who's the target? So they, uh, they eventually arrived. It wasn't a quick sail. They sat in Tampa Bay for about a week. Remember, everything was open sewage then. Tampa in Florida in a steel boat. They finally do get to Cuba. They land at Daiquiri. There's no piers there. The men are all floated in boats, row ashore. The animals are lowered over the side in slings. Roosevelt had two horses. Little Texas and Rain in the Face. Rain in the Face got caught up in a sling and drowned. It was one of, one of the few times that anybody heard Roosevelt with the exploitatives coming out of his mouth. And because uh, he was quite upset. They get there. And I might also stop this time too. What was the real crowning achievement of the Spanish American War? When you saw Richard's slideshow, you should have some ideas. Let me, let me rephrase. How did it benefit this nation? Expansion. Yes, expansion. Oh, yes, that's what you revisionists would say. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, imperialism and all that. Yes. No, there's a benefit that you're probably not even aware of now. Do you realize after the Civil War, if you're on the other side of the Mason Dixon line, it's called the War of Recent Unpleasantness, mm. do you realize? After 1865, there still was a South and there still was a North. South didn't even celebrate July 4th. McKinley had the presence of mind when he declared war to utilize ex-Confederate officers to fight in that war. And uh, we'll talk about one of them in a little bit. Do come in. We've been expecting you. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> And uh, that war brought this country together as the United States once again. Because both the North and South jumped on the bandwagon. It was a war that the country could get behind. They arrive in Cuba. Horrible supplies on the beach, everything mismanaged. Uh, Bad rations, bad equipment. First action they see is Las Guasimas. But they're actually ambushed by the Spaniards. The Rough Riders are on patrol. The Spaniards jump out. The Rough Riders hold the ground. And by the way, remember, they're on foot. They're not on horseback. The Spanish retreat. Now, fighting Joe Wheeler, Confederate general, had a number of horses shot out from underneath him during the Civil War. He was a See pictures of him. He's kind of slight, gray beard, wiry looking, tough as nails, but definitely showing his age. Because when the Spaniards run, fighting Wheeler jumps up, quick men, we have those damn Yankees on the run. <laughs> <laughs> now, just to jump to this area real quick. Joe Wheeler's daughter was a nurse at Camp Wyckoff, and his son died. You know how he died? Not from yellow fever, not malaria. No, he drowned in the surf. He was swimming in the surf. That yeah, was a horrible accident. The next battle, the Battle of San Juan Heights. They're at the foot of Kettle Hill. As a killing maelstrom of Mauser projectiles, Whiz through the air, chugging into eyes, hearts, limbs, and groins. We found it prudent to take cover. <laughs> but I distinctly remember, well, we had to take cover. We're waiting for orders to proceed, which, in my opinion, were horribly slow in coming. But I distinctly remember Captain Bucky O'Neill, with his perpetual cigarette hanging from his mouth, prancing back and forth in front of his troops, as if he were still the mayor of Prescott, Arizona. <laughs> His reply to a protesting sergeant was, there isn't a Spanish bullet made that'll kill me. 
He no sooner said this and laughingly <laughs> exhaled a cloud of smoke when the Mauser projectile whizzed it in the front of his mouth and burst out the back of his head. <laughs> but that the largest and kindest officer was dead before he hit the ground. Oh. Yeah, they were being shot out like fish in a barrel. When they finally get warned to advance, Roosevelt's Rough Riders, right between the 9th and 10th Cavalry, the Buffalo Soldiers, start up Kettle Hill. Roosevelt jumps up on Little Texas. He doesn't yell charge. He yells, follow me, men. And there's a soldier crouched down behind a shrub. Roosevelt looks down. Are you afraid? Do you not see me on horseback? And as that fellow got up, the Mauser projectile drilled him likewise. Oh, wow. Obviously, they're aiming at the colonel. They go up that hill, not on a run. At best, at a quick walk. Bullets flying all around. Every single senior officer that saw Roosevelt that day said, he's not coming back. A bullet nicked the back of his hand. Now they knocked his glasses off. But he carried extra pairs in his, in his hat band. <laughs> they get up to Kettle Hill. By the way, it was called Kettle Hill because it was a huge iron kettle for rendering you know, sugar cane. Now from that advantage point, they had to go up San Juan Hill. Little Texas is tangled in barbed wire, so he dismounts, and he yells, charge! A hundred yards up San Juan Hill, there's five men with him. Where is everybody? <laughs> the regiment had heard his command. You men take cover. He goes back, they're all apologetic, and they immediately charge him. <laughs> <laughs> but they, but they took San Juan Hill, and with that revolver, that Colt revolver, he did take out a few Spaniards with that. Because it was given to him to honor the sailors that were killed in the main. Just give you a little short story, a little sidetrack. If you remember in the news, there was a gun stolen from Sagamore Hill about 16 years ago. That was the one. It's been recovered, it's back on exhibit. Came back last May. And the real tragedy was you can't fire it because the National Parks Department, they disable guns. So you never be used as a gun. You can never display it over your mantle. Look what I have. Because you steal something from a, a federal site, the FBI's after you. You know what happened to that gun? No matter how diligent, any policeman worth the salt will tell you the same thing. Most cases are cracked by mere chance. <clears throat> Sagamore Hill received a call. It was a result of a messy divorce. The boyfriend of the ex-wife called up the hill and said, listen, I know, I know where the gun is. She had shown him the gun. It was wrapped up in a pillowcase in a closet down in Florida for 16 years. And he told her, goes, look, I know your ex-husband took it, but this, this has got to go back to the hill. So he, he said, look, I don't want anything to happen to me or my girlfriend because we're willing to turn over the gun. And the FBI went down there and recovered the gun. Mm -hmm. The other guy, they didn't want to make a big fuss of it. So the guy that actually stole the gun incurred, I think, a $250 fine and five years probation, <laughs> which to my mind is wrong. But that gun that played in, in Spittle Park in Roosevelt's life is back on exhibit. They win. The fighting war is finished by July 17th in Cuba. The tragedy of that war, the, most of the soldiers that died, died from uh, malnutrition, dysentery, typhoid, yellow fever, and malaria. Now, nobody had made the mosquito connection to mal malaria and yellow fever yet. They figured it was bad germs, bad vapors. So Roosevelt actually wrote a letter stating it would be criminals, a round robin letter. All the senior officers signed it. And uh, that it would be criminal to keep our army in Cuba any longer than necessary. Because the, you know, they're, they're dropping left and right. And that's probably what cost him his Medal of Honor in 1898. Because they wound up on the front pages of the newspaper. See, uh, General Shafter, wouldn't give out press releases, but the press would be in there, and this letter was on the desk, and he just, you know, kind of pushed the letter that way and walk away. So that letter wound up on the front pages of the newspaper, embarrassed the president, embarrassed the secretary of the army. When you do that, it's not good for your promotion, is it? 
<laughs> Nevertheless, Roosevelt was always like that in his life. If he believed in something, he stood up for it. The reason why they picked Montauk, it's out at the end of an island, not populated. This was the biggest population you know, before you got to, to Montauk. Westerly winds, so they figured the germs, those little yellow fever germs and microbes would blow out to sea. <laughs> and plus, the area is big enough, and as Richard mentioned, uh, President Corbin of the Long Island Railroad had done the survey work and track work to make Montauk Point a deep water port. When, when Corbin started on that, you see a steamship coming over across the Atlantic, you could get to New York a day quicker by landing in Montauk and riding his railroad in. <laughs> so all the things were there, ready. But, you know, I said they there on paper, as Rich showed you, it took a, a great team effort to put it together. Roosevelt lands, I think it was August 11th, August 10th, on the Miami, he came back on the Miami. And uh, the reporters are there. I feel embarrassingly healthy. Because he was fit, he was robust, and here guys being carried off in stretches. Soldiers could barely walk. I mean, they, they took a beating. And uh, Tiffany, Tiffany lost a son. Not in Cuba, but on the boat ride from Cuba to here. Got a typhoid. So there were a lot of losses here at Montauk and the eastern end of the island, but there would have been a lot more if this land wasn't here for him to come and recoup. And there would have been a lot more if communities like East Hampton hadn't sent supplies out, not just supplies, but manpower too. I mean, the citizens cared. I mean, it was a hugely popular war. To quote uh, John Hay, it was America's splendid little war. But people showed their patriotism and came out. That letter that, that you wrote, that you read, Rich, that the regiment of uh, the company of Rough Riders, you know what that was all about? Some 200 horses escaped of the regiment. All the, all the men's horses were kept in Tampa during the war. And those, those divisions came back here first before the people from Cuba came. So when, when the troopers came back, they were reunited with the horses. Well, about 200 of those horses got loose. They came right down the road through Amagasset in, into uh, East Hampton. So this detachment comes charging down. We could, so of course, all the residents, these guys in their uniforms, they're going, they're going crazy, you know, throwing up goodies and stuff. And then and they, and they, the soldiers would take buttons off their uniforms and pass them out as souvenirs. <laughs> so that, that's what that letter's all about. Now, Roosevelt still had a lot of press. I'm sure most of the articles you read had Colonel Roosevelt somewhere in there, right? <laughs> Figured in there somewhere. Boss Platt needed a candidate. Boss Platt was a United States Senator from New York at the time. Needed a Republican candidate for governor. The incumbent governor, Governor Black, who was a Republican, wouldn't make it if he, if he ran for re-election because he was tainted by the Erie Canal Commission scandal. So Platt reluctantly approached Roosevelt. It was front page press, and uh, it's really not fair to, to TR, but he wrote a book about the Rough Riders in 1913, and the critic, critics panned it. Why well, he should have called it The Load in Cuba. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing is, well, they, they were setting the typeface, they ran out of the letter I. <laughs> but if you ever read the book, The Rough, it's very good. And he's not braggadocious at all. He explains the nicknames of his troops and the list of where troops come from. It's a good read. Well, anyway, due to that popularity, Platt approaches Roosevelt and due to his reputation as assemblyman and New York City police commissioner, but he also knew that Roosevelt was a loose cannon on deck. He made Roosevelt give him a promise. If he should win the governorship, anybody that he appoints to his administration He'll discuss with Platt first. And Roosevelt promised. Won the election. He and his Rough Riders crisscrossed New York campaigning. Didn't win by much, by about 21,000 votes. Roosevelt did keep his promise, though. Whenever he was about to appoint somebody to his administration, he would set up a meeting with Tom Platt, usually at the plaza, a breakfast meeting. 
And, but see, it didn't matter if Platt wanted the man or not. If Roosevelt was appointing this person to his administration, he was being appointed. But we did have a talk with Platt beforehand. <laughs> a thousand bills signed into law when Roosevelt was governor. A bill that ended segregation in New York State schools. A bill that taxed utilities for the first time. A bill that banned the use of feathers in the manufacturing of women's clothing. See, species of birds on the brink of extinction, simply for plumage, for hats. Created the first Interstate Parks Commission. You know it as Palisades and Bear Mountain. Increased uh, the Adirondack State Park. There's a little bit too much of a reform governor for Boss Platt. When McKinley ran for re-election, his, his running mate had passed away. So there was an opening there. I want that man out of my state. <laughs> <laughs> so they kind of congealed Roosevelt to run for vice president. I, I think I'd almost want to be anything else than a vice president. Perhaps a history professor. <laughs> Reluctantly, he knew, he knew he had to pay his dues. So. In fact, he had made arrangements to study law. In fact, he one of the Supreme Court justices as a teacher. He becomes vice president. Six months through his vice president, vice presidency, President McKinley's up in Buffalo, the Pan American Exposition. My friends, if you study history at all, I'm sure this group does. Am I right or wrong? <laughs> but you know, there's nothing new. It's all one continuous yeah. cycle. Roosevelt becomes our 26th president through an act of terrorism almost to the day from our recent, 100 years from our recent act of terrorism, 9-11. McKinley shot 9-6. 1901 at the Pan American Exposition. They operate to get the bullet up. By the way, he was shot. He was on a receiving line at the Temple of Music, a warm day in September. And this was this is summer casual. If you saw the old pictures, so everybody had their neckerchief out. It's one fellow, Leon Shogosh, an anarchist, which is a 19th century terrorist. He had his neckerchief out, but he was wrapped around a pistol he had concealed in his hand. He goes up to shake McKinley's hand, blam! Shoots him in the stomach. McKinley's immediately operated on. They put him in an electric ambulance, so I contested. McKinley was the first president to ride in a motorized vehicle, <laughs> although not willing. <laughs> they bring him to the, uh, Roosevelt is known as the first president to ride in an automobile. But I say McKinley, once again, not willing. <laughs> they, bring, they bring him to a clinic, and the only person he could get was a gynecologist to operate on. <laughs> they get the bullet out. He might have made it. He might have made it. There's somewhat of a new procedure called draining a wound. <laughs> if they installed a drain, he might have made it. What happened, they sewed him up, and he actually died of uh, gangrene of the pancreas. <laughs> McKinley passes away September 14th, 1901. 914-1901. Yeah. Now what's a dreadful thing? To ascend to the presidency in that matter? But it would have been a far worse thing to have been morbid about it. <laughs> and other senators were, were kind of worried. When, we, when Roosevelt was, you know, nominated vice president and he won that position, Mark Hanna, a senator from Ohio, said, My God, there's but one heartbeat between that damn cowboy and this nation of ours. <laughs> well, that, he became our president. Uh, I'm just going to go through a little quick and leave it open for some questions. He wins in his own right in 1904 by a huge landslide, something like six million votes, but vows not to seek a third term on election eve. Well, I believe this nation deserves a strong leader, but I do not believe it deserves a perpetual leader. <laughs> of course, that was a generation before his fifth cousin. <laughs> <laughs> he makes plans to go to Africa because he didn't want to be in Washington. He believed a strong leader shouldn't be around as a hindrance. And I did not wish to make Africa a mere holiday, but rather a scientific expedition. 
which it was. It was financed by the Smithsonian to send back specimens. <laughs> and he's gone from the country for about a year and a quarter. Goes into Africa, comes out in North Africa, visits Europe, picks up his Nobel Peace Prize. Do you realize he was the first American to receive a Nobel Peace Prize? No. Oh, yeah, you hear about expansionism and imperialism. <laughs> yeah. He mediated the Russia-Japanese War in 1905. Every king and emperor and queen fussed over him in Europe as if he was still the president. Roosevelt could speak several languages fluently, one of them German. The Kaiser's reviewing the troops for Roosevelt. And the Kaiser had a tendency to stick his foot in the mouth off. <laughs> says to T.R., your flag has always resembled a candy cane. <laughs> always reminded me of a candy cane. Well, that might well be. Remember, Roosevelt replies right back in German. That might well be. It might resemble a piece of candy, but rest assured, no one has licked it yet. He <laughs> <laughs> comes back <coughs> June 1910, there were 10 million people in Manhattan to greet him. Steps down off the gangplank. I think if I should meet another king, I shall bite him. <laughs> so tired of being fussed over. Vows to go back to Sagamore Hill and close up like a native oyster in Oyster Bay. <laughs> Shortly after he gets there, there were delegations of people asking him to run in 1912. 1912 was the first year we had primaries in the presidential election. He was defrauded of his delegates at the Republican National Convention. They bolted and performed the Progressive Party. A great democracy has got to be progressive. Or soon, it'll see, or soon it'll cease to be either great or a democracy. He comes out of that convention. And by the way, his favorite title throughout his life was simply Colonel. Colonel, Colonel, how do you feel about running on the progressive ticket? I feel as fit as a bull moose, and they may use me to the limit. <laughs> what was the platform on that party? Just about everything we take for granted. Woman suffrage. The abolishment of child labor, eight hour work days, minimum wage, workmen's compensation. First time this came up in a presidential election, universal health care. Oh yeah, they were, they, were, they were considered communists by then. <laughs> well, what, what do candidates do? They campaign. Roosevelt's out in Milwaukee. October 14, 1912, he leaves the Hotel Grill Patrick. He's waving to the crowd on the way to the auditorium. But blam! I wasn't shooting here this time. Was <laughs> <laughs> Shoots Roosevelt square in the chest. The bullet goes through his eyeglass case, through his folded speech, into his chest on the right hand side. What did he study at Harvard? Naturally. Naturally. He's able to diagnose himself. And he tells this to a reporter a number of years later. He got back up on his feet, then told him his spine wasn't damaged. <laughs> <clears throat> no blood, that meant the bullet had pierced his lung. So we knew it was an immediately fatal wound. We knew there were two possibilities. Pulmonary edema, which was certainly fatal. Or at the very least, he would be so stiff and black and blue that he wouldn't be able to campaign. So he takes his neckerchief, he stuffs it in the bullet wound, calls the mob off John Trank, who was later judged insane. He was delusional. He would say that McKinley would come to him in his dreams. You must avenge my death. <laughs> so he's, he's, he spent the rest of his life in insane asylum. Let me just digress a little bit on that. He lived to about 1944, John Trank. And every once in a while they'd interview him, see if he's making any progress. <laughs> Franklin, Roosevelt's fifth cousin, was running for his third term. And he goes, uh, well, how do you feel about the current Roosevelt running for a third term? Well, I'd shoot him too. <laughs> Back, back to the padded room. <laughs> so Roosevelt proceeds, refuses medical attention, proceeds on into the auditorium, holding a speech up in the air, which now has a bullet hole through it. <laughs> my friends, my friends, I must ask you to listen very carefully. I don't know if you fully realize it, but I have a bullet in my body. <laughs> it's just what they did. They know he was shot. He opens up his coat. It's all bloodstained. There's a hush. But don't worry, don't worry. It takes more than a bullet to kill a bull moose. <laughs> and he delivered a 90 minute speech before he would allow them to take him to the hospital. I didn't care a rap for being shot. It's a trade risk which every prominent public man ought to accept as a matter of course. 
And he was out of the campaign for about two weeks. Came in second to Wilson. Second doesn't get you anything in presidential races. Was Roosevelt upset? Well, he took a bullet for it. How did he handle it? He accepts a speaking tour in South America several years later. And they invite him, the nation of Brazil invites him on exploring the river of doubt. They knew it was a major river. People had gone down and never seen it yet. <laughs> Roosevelt jumps on this opportunity, <laughs> poorly planned compared to his African trip. You know, these big 1,200 pound dugout canoes, poor supplies, the wrong kind of stuff, provision. There's a great book out called Dark Journey, River of Doubt by Candace Millard. It's been out a couple of years. Great read, I recommend it. Explains why it was so poorly planned and everything. Uh, Roosevelt injures his legs in the rapids, incurs a fever of 105, loses over 50 pounds, almost dies, almost takes his own life. He would carry a vial of morphine with him in case he was maimed or, or crippled or couldn't make it out so he could put himself down. And the only reason why he didn't do it, his son Kermit was with him in Africa, was with him in South America. He knew Kermit would probably die trying to get his father's body out. So Roosevelt barely made it through that river, but he did put a 900 mile river on the map and Brazil renamed it the Rio Roosevelt. And he, it, but he incurred parasitic ailments that plagued him the rest of his life, did shorten his life. Shortly after he gets back, World War I breaks out. He criticized Wilson for not honoring the Hague Convention. When we finally do go to war, he takes his hat in his hand. He goes down to Washington to offer his services to raise a regiment, as he did in 1898. And Wilson turns him down. He comes out, and the reporters go, Colonel, Colonel, did you get your regiment? I have been blackballed by the Committee of Emissions. This is a very exclusive war. <laughs> he didn't get any sees General House. And he tells the general, doesn't the president realize I just wanted a chance to die in France? And House goes, well, did you make that clear to President Wilson? <laughs> All four of his sons serve. His youngest daughter served in the Red Cross. His youngest son was an aviator, learned to fly at Hazelhurst Airfield. You've heard of that, right? Hazelhurst? Anybody? Some of you have probably been to Hazelhurst. I don't know. Hazelhurst Airfield, but yeah. It's in the Hempstead Plains. You see, when Quentin was shot down and killed on July 14th, 1918, they renamed it Roosevelt Field. It's named after Quentin, that theater. Roosevelt dies in his sleep about six months after Quentin was killed. Reoccurring bouts of ailments from South America. They were priming him to run for the presidency. And if he had lived, he probably would have won. He certainly would have beat Wilson. Um, he died in his sleep at 3.40 in the morning on January 6th, pulmonary embolism. He was, you know, just recovering from a bout of a, a jungle fever. So I'd like to open it up for some questions about to you. Don't hesitate. I'm not looking for exact dates of what happened. Think about the human. Yeah. He had a large family, but poor Alice went out of the picture very early on. So no, no way. He lived forever. No. The wife died, the first wife? Yeah. Yes. And his sister raised baby Alice for two years. That's, was that Alice Longworth's baby? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And she was a character, the pres yeah, the Princess was. Alice. Yeah. She promised her father that she would not smoke her cigarettes under the roof of the White House. <laughs> now, Alice would never break a promise. She could find a loophole. And by the way, Alice made press when she was only like 14 when she came out of Montauk in 1898. She was like the belle of the ball out here. You see, she wouldn't break a promise. You know how she got around it? She smoked her cigarettes on top of them. <laughs> she would go to, she would go to these, these parties, these fancy events in Washington with her pet steak in her purse called Emily's spinach. <laughs> After two things she didn't care about, it was a green steak, so spinach, and Emily was her aunt. On her mother's side, it was extremely thin. <laughs> she would careen around and get speeding tickets for driving 25 miles an hour without an escort in Washington. She was always in the press, always. His friend, Owen Winston, the author of The Virginian, 
who had gone to Harvard with TR, was visiting him one day at the White House, and Alice keeps bursting in the room. So Owen finally says, Theodore, is there nothing you can do to control Alice? I can do one of two things. I can either be President of the United States or I can control Alice. But I can't possibly do both. <laughs> now, she was actually the last of the children to pass away. She was 96 in March 1980 when she passed away. Could sit in a full lotus position up to the age of 92. She married a congressman from Ohio, which became Speaker of the House, Nicholas Longworth, and spent the rest of her life living in Washington. Did uh, Colonel Roosevelt uh, talk with uh, President McKinley when McKinley came down? To oh, yes, yes. Yes, they had a conference. Remember, he was McKinley's Assistant Secretary of the Navy before the war. Oh, yeah, they, they had a lot to say. And Thomas Platt came down here, too. Sir, in the back. Yeah, were there any other Camp Wyckoffs around the country, or had all the soldiers from Cuba come from Oslo? Yeah, just about the entire army came here to uh, Long Island and Montauk. Now, as so it got into September, October, those who were well were sent home. And I think quite a few went home on their own, whether they were well or not. But in lieu of the cool weather coming, the remainder was sent to uh, the camp in uh, Huntsville, Alabama, Joe, Joe Wheeler, Camp Wheeler. With all that intermingling with the townspeople and the, the camp, weren't, weren't there any townspeople that caught time for you? No, not really. I, I, I never read reports of that. Rich, have you come across reports of that? Yeah, I even gave some. Yes, but not a lot. Not, not, a, not a lot. lot. But there was certainly a fear, and a fear of yellow fever and malaria. They didn't know that you have to get yellow fever through a mosquito bite. Yeah. So there was that fear. And typhoid, I might add, typhoid wasn't indicative of just the Spanish-American War. That was, you would, have, you would have outbreaks of that right on up into modern, you know, antibodies, until they found the, the sanitary causes and stuff. And of course, I'm sure there might have been quite a few other problems with the interview with the soldiers, being, I'm speaking as an ex-veteran. Any other, yeah? And the soldiers that died at Camp Wycock, where were they buried? In the ground, usually. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <It's hilarious. laughs> Rich, do you know that? I think a lot of them were also shipped back home, too. Yeah, but there's still, there. I think there still are about 100 graves there. Really? So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, whereabouts? You know, you know where, whereabouts? No, I've seen it on a map. I've not visited it. Do you have a question? I do. Um, was question there, away. Was there, was there an Indian population still in Montauk at that time? Very little, very little. They, you know, they've all been shoved back to the Shinnecock area. Okay. The canal area right now. But you know, what, you know what Montauk was used for, basically, right? Cattle. Cattle. That's where you, that's where you sink your cattle in the summer. In the summer, yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions? By the way, that's one of the reasons why they picked it, because it was not popular. Yeah. Then I'll leave you with this. It's good advice. Roosevelt quoted it, and you live by it. I try to live by it. It's good stuff. Do the best you can with what you have, where you are. Far better it is to dare mighty things, to win glorious victories, although checkered by failure, than to take rank with those poor spirits but neither suffer much nor enjoy much, but they dwell in that great twilight that knows not victory. Keep your eyes on the stars, but remember to keep your feet firmly on the ground. Thank you. Thank you.